1 Timothy chapter number 3. We'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Let me stop right there. Uh, just because somebody desires something doesn't mean it's God's will. The Bible says, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. But it's not God's will for everybody to be a pastor. That's very important to understand. Uh, I don't know how many young men uh, surrender to preach the gospel and then immediately they think that they need to be, be the pastor. I don't know how many old men who have sat in a congregation think that they know more than the pastor. Okay. So just keep in mind, just because somebody desires something don't mean it's God's will. I desire to live in Triple Crown. That hadn't happened. I'm not envious of those that live there. I just want to be their neighbor. And what's that one street I want to live on? Omaha Trace. That's the street I want to live on. Every house has six-car garages. I don't have six cars, but if I could live on that street, I would. Yeah. Huh? Do you realize their taxes are more than my house payment every year? But I desire it. Just ain't the will of God. Hmm? Huh? Couldn't you imagine the fellowships we'd have at the pastor's house there? We could all show up, and we'd be socially distanced everywhere in the house. Verse number 2 says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality on Omaha Trace, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. Not a brawler, not covetous. Uh-oh, I better repent before I teach this tonight. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man not know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be graved, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in pure conscience, and let these also, be, uh, also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For if they have used the office of a deacon well, purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for enlightening our minds to truth. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done in our lives. And thank you for the church. Now, Father, help us tonight. Edify your people. Encourage us. Instruct us. Help us to embrace your truth. Help us, Lord, to understand even more fully the responsibilities of having the truth. For you said, where much is given, much is required. Now, Father, may tonight we grow ever closer to you. May we ever truly appreciate the good things of God. Thank you for Brother Amos and Miss Gracie being here tonight. Lord, it's a blessing to see them. Lord, I pray for Victory Baptist Church. You would bless them abundantly. And Lord, I neglected mentioning prayer requests. Miss Bella told me that one of her classmates is sick. I pray for her classmate. Lord, you would touch them and help them. Now, Father, bless... And we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we ask it all. Amen and amen. Um, tonight I said we're going to look at the officers of the church. There are only two officers of the local church. There's the pastor and the deacons. 
Now, make no mistake, there are others who help in the ministry, but there are only two ordained, set-aside positions, officers, uh, for the local church. And tonight we're going to look at those. We'll look first at the pastor. In verse number 1, in verse number 2, it mentions the term bishop. Bishop and pastor both uh, hold the same true meaning. It means the over overseer. Now, if you are a student of the Bible, you will find three times the Lord Jesus is called the shepherd. He's the good shepherd, he's the chief shepherd, and he's the great shepherd. The pastor, the overseer of the flock of God, is commonly understood and known to be the under-shepherd. We started uh, last week telling you that the local church is God's government or God's institution on the face of the earth. And if you want the blueprint for the local church, you need to look at the church of the wilderness. The church of the wilderness under Moses is the blueprint for how God moves and works in His local church today. The local church is God's government on earth. And under the church of the wilderness, you would find Moses would go onto the mountain of God, and God would speak to Moses. Uh, uh, we know while on the mountain, God uh, uh, pinned out the Ten Commandments with His own finger in stone, and Moses brought them down. And Moses also in, uh, received all the instruction uh, 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 on the tabernacle, on the law, and everything that he would need in order to lead God's people and govern God's people. Uh, uh, when the church of the wilderness uh, and those Jews there in the wilderness uh, did what God said through Moses, God blessed. Uh, but when they would rebel or murmur or complain against the man of God, God would bring judgment on them. Can I say tonight, the pastor is not a dictator. The pastor is not a lord over the church, uh, but the pastor is God's man. And when God's man spends time with God, and God speaks through God's man, uh, and God's man gets up and says, What thus saith the Lord? Uh, and when the church does what God says, uh, God blesses. Uh, when the church murmurs or complains uh, or gets sideways with the man of God, then God brings judgment on the church. Well, let's look at some things about the pastor, can't we? Now listen, I know I'm the pastor. I've been for 21 years. Got an office on the on the door of the office. It says pastor. I have to constantly look at that to remind myself that I am living my dream. I get to be the pastor of the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Now make no mistake. The church voted me in as pastor, but God called me to be the pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church. What I'm about to teach on, I'm teaching the Bible. There will be a day, if Jesus don't come, that I won't be the pastor. Mm, let's just be honest. Uh, time goes on. Get old. There come a point when there will be another pastor. So you need to know what the book says about the pastor. Mm. Um, let me just qualify this real quickly right here. There are three things that causes God to bless the church. A church that is mission minded because God told us to go into all the world Acts 1 8 he told us to uh, uh, be witnesses under Jerusalem Judea Samaria the uttermost parts of the world when we are mission minded because we can't go to all the world we had brother Ted Ritchie here on Sunday he's going to Romania to the gypsies we can't go to Romania to the gypsies but we can send him and the beauty about supporting missionaries and supporting all those missionaries over there, and we actually have more now than what's on that board, the beauty of that is every time they win somebody to God because we're helping them, and God puts another star in our crown just as if we would have won them. God blesses mission-minded churches. God blesses evangelistic-minded churches. Where to win our Jerusalem? Florence is our Jerusalem. And God blesses churches that win souls, that get out into the neighborhood and let people know that Jesus loves them and Jesus wants to save them. The third thing that causes God to bless a church is a church that takes care of her pastor. The pastor of the local church is the church's first missionary and most 
or the biggest responsibility of that church. The Bible says that it is ordained of a God, ordained of God if a, a man preached the gospel that he lived by the gospel. Now that's not always the case. Not every church is in a position to be able to support the pastor full time. Uh, I, when I started out, I was by vocation. I was working three jobs uh, in pastoring. Um, it's not always uh, able uh, uh, a necessity. Uh, or not in this, it, it's not always something that can be done. But if the church can do it, the church ought to do it. And when a church takes real good care of her pastor, God takes real good care of the church. And uh, can I say, our church is guilty of all three of those things. We get out in the neighborhoods, we support missions, and our church, you all take great care and have for years, me and my dear family, and that's why God has blessed our church. That's why we're getting ready to go into another building program. Because God has been good. Because we do that, our, our first part. So let's look at the pastor. Now, I said all that to say this. I'm going to teach on the pastor, not because I think you ought to take better care of me. Y'all do take good care of me. But you still need to know why you're supposed to take care, good care of the pastor. Okay? All right. Now, let's look at the pastor. The first thing I want you to notice about the pastor is the pastor's requirements or qualifications. Not everybody can be a pastor. Not everybody's called to be a pastor, and not everybody is qualified to be a pastor. And in this passage, the Apostle Paul, writing to young Timothy, lays out the qualifications for a pastor. And so let's look at these qualifications. We find in verse number 2, the Bible says a bishop then must be blamed. The very first qualification knocks most men out of the pastorate. Now, can I say this? Outside the blood of Jesus Christ, there is nobody who is truly blameless. Nobody meets that qualification outside of the good grace of God. But what does blameless mean? Blameless means that no evil can be proved against him. That he's not deficient in anything. That he's irreprehensible. Uh, in other words, you don't have a man standing here that somebody can come in and bring charges that he's guilty of something of breaking the law outside these walls. That brings shame on the church when you've got a sorry, no good pastor. If your pastor don't pay his bills, he don't need to be your pastor. When everybody down at the bank knows he's a deadbeat, do you think they're going to come to your church? See, there, to be blameless means he needs to be beyond reproach. And can I say there's a lot of sorry, no good men who are preachers who are not blameless. Can I say it is a common, common theme in the business world that most pastors don't pay their bills. That is a sorry, sorry testimony. You know why a lot of you all didn't amen right there? Because some of you don't pay your bills. You want me to help you on a real good thing, and we'll get to it later in, the, in our study, but this will help you to pay your bills. Pay your tithes first. Huh? You put God first, He's promised to bless you. Where's all them amens I got a minute ago? I learned a long time ago, if you tithe and give an offering, you'll have enough. <laughs> God's, God's just good. He said... Prove me now if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you cannot contain. Hmm? I have to say, God's good. Amen. Hmm. Some of y'all start tithing and you start amening. Well, he needs to be blameless. The second qualification is the one that most people get hung up on. I contend you don't even need to get to the second one. You've got to deal with the first one first. But the second one says he must be the husband 
of one wife. Does everybody understand that? Sure. Well, that's good because most people don't. How many of you believe that God says what He means and means what He says? Hmm? He said He must be the husband of one wife. Now somewhere along the line, there's some lame brain come up and said, well, in the Greek that means one wife at a time. That's not what God said. You see, they want to justify it. They say, well, back when the Bible was written, polygamy, polygamy was going real rampant, and you know, David had uh, a bunch of wives, and Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines, and so uh, God had to put it in there, you only had to have one wife. Okay? Well, that all makes sense, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he must be the husband of one wife. Now, what does that simply mean? That simply means the man that stands behind the sacred desk of God cannot be divorced and remarried. Because if he's divorced and remarried, that means he's got two wives. In some cases, some of them have three wives and four wives. And, uh, good night in the morning, as you would say. Huh? The pastor is to be the husband of one wife. You say, well, what if his wife leaves him? Then he can't be the pastor. Now, I know in cases where men try to still pastor without having a wife. His wife got fed up and left him. That's a sad, tragic story. But he can't pastor. Number one, you all know my, my personal conviction, my rule. I don't counsel with any woman without my wife being present. Hmm? They say, well, what if she wants to tell you something in secret? Then she'll tell me in front of my wife or she'll keep it to herself. The Bible says to abstain from all appearance of evil. If I'm in a room by myself with a woman, it doesn't look good. So how can I pastor when I don't have a wife and I can't counsel women? How can I pastor without a help me? I've said for years, y'all tolerate me because you love her. And there's a lot of truth to that. The pastor has to be the husband of one wife. Now, people try to bend and stretch and twist and do all kinds of things with that, and it doesn't work. Now, what does verse number one say? If this, or this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless husband. What is this text talking about? The office of what? The pastor. It's talking about the office of the pastor. Oh, let me just talk to you for a minute. I said that the pastor must be the husband of one wife. What about a lay preacher? Phil don't have a wife. Does that mean he's not qualified to preach? You got it. He can preach, but he can't pastor. Actually, he could because his wife's in heaven. But I wouldn't recommend it. You ought to find your wife first. Well, that opens another question. What if he gets remarried? She's got to meet the qualifications. She's either got to be a widow or have never been married. You see, a man can preach but not pastor if he has a tainted past. I've known men that have been divorced and remarried long before they got saved. Got saved. Then God used them in nursing home ministry. I'm thinking of one right now. He's in heaven right now. He preached in two nursing homes for 35 years. There were people who would pass away, preach their funerals. Uh, uh, family members would come and have church with their family, with him. They thought he was their pastor. He was there faithfully. He knew he, he couldn't pastor. But I tell you what, he made a difference in those people's lives, preaching truth to them. So there are things people can do 
that have tainted past. They just can't pastor. You say, well, that's very discriminatory. Well, take it up with God. See, the problem is, when we start twisting God's qualifications, we start disqualifying the church. We will see before this study is over that Jesus is coming back for a church without spot and without wrinkle. He's coming for an unblemished church, so we must adhere to the Scriptures or we'll blemish His church. And we'll pay the price in judgment. We see that he must be the husband of one wife. Now again, people want to twist that all the time. You know, well, I know a man who had four doctorate degrees and he had four wives. He wasn't qualified to pastor. Huh? So, uh, you know, don't add to or take away from the Word of God. Just believe the Word of God. I don't want to get hung up all right there all night tonight. Let me give you something else. Here, turn with me in John chapter 4. I want to show you something. We're talking about truth. Let me ask you a question. How many of you believe that God knew what He was doing when He wrote the Scriptures? Now, let, we haven't got on the study of the Scriptures yet, but we will get on the study of the Scriptures. But let me just say that, how many of you believe that the Holy Ghost wrote the Bible? Man didn't write the Bible. Just like this pen right here doesn't write down my thoughts. It's just the instrument that my hand uses to write down the thoughts. The holy men that God appointed to pin down the Scriptures were just the pen. The Holy Ghost wrote the Bible, and we'll, we'll discover that when we get on the Bible. Trust me, we'll get into all that. But, so then, if God wrote the Bible, don't you think God knew what He wrote and meant what He said? All right, I, I want you to see something, because I, I, I've got friends that don't understand this. Because some Bible professor taught them something. Now listen, i got a Bible degree, but if it don't line up with the Bible, it's just hogwash. Hmm? I told you we're starting this from my flat, heat, flat head to my flat feet I'm a Baptist but more than being a Baptist I'm a Bible believer there's a lot of Baptists that twist things alright let's John chapter 4 I want to show you this I don't know why it's not my notes but here you go um, we're talking about the woman at the well you know the story well if you've, if you, if you've studied the Bible uh, look in verse 16 Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. What did she say? I have how many husbands? None. She said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. She said, I have no husband. Jesus said, What you're saying is true. That's what he's saying. Thou hast well said, I have no husband. Now look at verse 18. For thou hast had... Now, I'm an English non-connoisseur, but had is past tense. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. Let me set the table here. Jesus said, go call your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, what you're saying is true. He said, but you've had five, past tense. The one you have, present tense, is not your husband. She was divorced five times and she's shacking up with a man. And he says, what you said is true. Okay? Now, why did I bring all that out? I know preachers that say that if you have a sexual relationship with somebody, it's marriage in the eyes of God. And if you had a sexual relationship with somebody before you got married, uh, then you've got two wives. That's not what Jesus said. Now, let me help you something. I'm against sexual relationships outside of marriage. That's against the will of God. That's sin. That's fornication. But can I help you with something? Sex outside of marriage is not marriage in the eyes of God. 
because Jesus just said it wasn't. Now, I've got preacher friends that will fight me tooth and toenail over that, and I've told them they can be wrong if they want to, and Jesus will straighten them out when they get to heaven. All right. You know, I've known men in the military and live a hellacious life, get out and get saved. And then God called them to preach, and then they go on to pastor. But based on theology from some of these guys, they're not qualified to pastor because of the life they had in the military before they got saved. I do remind you, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. I right. thought I'd throw that out there. I mean, you know, I don't know why it's not my notes. Anyway. We'll never get this one done tonight. I can tell you that right now. Uh, should be the husband and one wife. Should be vigilant. That means watchful. Let me just say this. I'm thankful. Hallelujah. Uh, Phil, say hallelujah. Thank you. Used to, we had some folks in the church, they thought it was their job to tell the preacher what to do. And some of you that have been here for a while, some of you remember when Ray had hair. You will remember me saying something like this. I'm glad I don't have to say this anymore. But I used to have to say, when you've prayed about it as much as I have, and when you've wrestled with it with God as much as I have, then you can tell me what to do. You see, a lot of times while you're in bed sleeping unless you're on third shift like Christian right now while you're uh, counting sheep or you know dreaming about gun drops or whatever you dream about I'm still up 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning with my mind consumed with the church you see Preaching is the easiest thing I ever get to do. The real task of a man of God is getting his mind conditioned where he can hear from God. The real task of a man of God is being able to look beyond the congregation and see what's coming down the road. To look at the wolves in sheep's clothing. To look at the snares that are laid before you. To look at the bends around the curve and what is hiding and lurking in the shadows. You see, a human can't do that. But one who conditions himself to be able to discern and listen to the voice of God can watch for his sheep. And my dear friends... That's the part they don't teach you about in Bible college, and that's the part that nobody ever signs up for. But that's the most needful part in being a pastor. And I say this, the man of God, the pastor, must be sober. And that's more than just not being drunk. Uh, that's simply meaning being aware. Hmm? The man of God is also to be of good behavior. It's hard when you're smart, Ellie. But you need to act right. Have some civility about you. The man of God's got to be given to hospitality. Someone that's hospitable. Someone that entertains people. And takes people out to dinner. And discusses that what's going on in their life has people in his home and, and just you know is there for people and he must be apt to teach very important how can he help somebody if he doesn't know anything a man of God has to be given to study has to have learned this book but he also needs to learn some other things about life. Understand human nature. Understand some things about what's going on in the world. He's got to be well versed. He just can't be all the letter of the law all the time. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. He's got to be apt to teach. Instruct people. 
help people. Hmm? Needs to be a jack of all trades. Needs to be able to talk to Brother Ray about carpentry. Needs to talk with Brother Peter about combustion and engines. Uh, needs to be able to talk to Brother Brian about food. I know I'd find a glutton in here somewhere. Just got to be able to talk to folks. I've known men that were super smart in the Bible, but, I mean, they were a doorknob. You couldn't talk to them. Hmm? My mind keeps wanting to get ahead of myself. Let me, let me go on. Not given to wine. Hmm? That's pretty clear, isn't it? Now let me just qualify this. I don't have time to get into all this either. If you want the books, I'll give you the books on it. If I hear one more person tell me, Jesus drank wine. It's okay for me to drink wine. Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for the stomach's sake. Well... A lot of people want to use modern terminology and apply it to the Bible. Jesus' first miracle, he turned the water into wine. And the host of the feast said, why do we save the best for last? Now what's he talking about? Jesus turned it into wine. Now we would call that grape juice. Welch's. It wasn't fermented. That's why he said, why is the best saved for last? The other stuff's intoxicating. It'll kill you. This is sweet. This is wonderful. This is refreshing. I don't have time to get into the Bible days. You couldn't drink the milk because it wasn't pasteurized. They didn't have Coca-Cola. They didn't have, you know, a lot of juices we got today. They had the fruit of the vine. Anytime you find Jesus anywhere around the thought of wine, it was grape juice. Why would he talk about Wine is a mockery. And why would you talk about strong drink in the Bible and, and condemn it and then partake of it? You're telling me Jesus was a hypocrite? No. And here it's dealing with the same thing. It's dealing with, uh, you know, don't give yourself to something that will intoxicate you. And when Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach, he's talking about grape juice. Settle your stomach. Do you know there's so many healing qualities in Welsh's grape juice? The antioxidants and all that's in that is good for you. Hmm? <coughs> Me, I don't need grape juice to settle my stomach. Coca-Cola does fine. Huh? Not given wine. No striker. That's uh, somebody who is... Uh, constantly running a crusade and, and, and striving to uh, picket abortion clinics and all those kind of things and launching out at people and, and trying to prove a point and, and all of that. God, didn't co God told us to be meek and loving and compassionate. Uh, somebody else can do all that stuff. We're the church. We're to show compassion to people. We're not to be strikers. It goes on to say that uh, not greedy of filthy lucre. Uh, filthy lucre is any kind of money or anything you get with dishonest gain. Not to do anything that you get uh, something under the table for. Mm, that's filthy lucre. You know, I know evangelists. They can go into a crowd and before long they'll figure out who's got money and they'll they'll buddy up to them and every time they're in town they'll call that person because they know that that person's going to give them a green handshake can I say that's how the will of God hmm. that's somebody doing it for filthy lucre that's somebody in Jeremiah's days where he said the pastors had become brutish where they'd fleece the flocks that's not a, that's not a man of God that's a hireling and the man of God is not to be that way. It says to be patient. Uh, to be patient simply means to weigh out a matter before you act on it. 
Now, there are sometimes you need to be swift to act. But there are sometimes you need to spend time in discerning from God. Be still and know that I'm God type stuff. You've got to be patient. The Bible says, not a brawler. Uh, somebody's not going to roll up their shirt sleeves and smack somebody around. That's not godly. Not a brawler. Not covetous. Not a lover of money. <laughs> These preachers that get in it for the money, boy, they're, 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 they're grossly mistaken. Hmm? Huh? Listen, y'all good to me. You're better to me than most pastors got, I promise you. When I first went to the pastor, I was making over $2,000 a week and left for $150 a week. Those that have been here 20 years, they know all that. That's why they want to break their neck to be good to us today, because it can be. And we appreciate that. But it can't be for the love of money. That's why that crowd on TV, you can just chalk them up as wicked. Do you know how many preachers I've had tell me that I needed to write a book? Do you know, even Miss Tina in my Sunday school class a few weeks ago said, you need to write a book on this. You know one reason why I haven't written a book? Because people think I was just trying to make money on it. If I wrote a book, I'd just, if I had to put a price on it, it would be what the cost of the thing was. It wouldn't be about me. I just want to get the information out. But it's it's there's so many people in it for the money. It's one thing I appreciated going over there last night, Brother Fox. He had a bunch of CDs and he's got a tremendous voice. And he said, just take them, just what any donation you want to give. That was a blessing. Most people only want fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars for the things, huh? Anyway. Uh, not covetous. Verse four is very important. One that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. That word gravity means have a pull on them. How can a man of God stand up and tell everybody else how to run their house when he doesn't run his house? Can I say a man of God needs to be the head of his house? I've seen a lot of men stand behind the pulpit and their wife wears the pants in the household. That's why God never blesses the church. Hmm? man of God's got to be the husband, got to be the head. And we know the, the wife is the keeper of the home, and most times she's the neck that turns the head. Mm, but he's got to be the head of the household. The children need to respect him, be obedient. And can I say you can tell when the children respect the father? You can tell. Uh, you can also tell when the father don't know the word no. And you can really tell when the father don't know how to take his belt off. You say, are you a sanction for capital punishment? Only if they need it. And if they need it, there's a nice little padded backside where you can take care of that business. And usually if you take care of it right, you don't have to take care of it often. They learn real quick. Uh but we live in a generation where we let the children run the household and we wonder what in the world's going on in this world. Hmm? But he must rule his family. If the children don't respect their father, how are you expected your children to respect him? Hmm? The Bible goes on to say, uh, verse number 6, not a novice. You ought to underscore that. Jesus was 30 years of age before he started his earthly ministry. We're talking about the very Son of God who, very, who created everything. I've said this. I've yet to have anybody prove me wrong. In my lifetime. I don't know about years gone by, but I know in my lifetime. I've yet to meet a man that they put in the office of a pastorate under the age of 30 that's made it. Most of them are out of the ministry by the time they're 30. A young man is full of zeal, but not according to knowledge, the Bible says. A young man has a lot of pride. A young man can't handle the pressure that it takes to stand behind this desk and face this crowd. We can, we, how many preachers have you seen come, back, come stand behind this desk and say, man, I get nervous back here. 
You know why? Because just not anybody can stand back here. Hmm. Now, I'm going to say something. If a man can't preach behind this desk, I'm talking about this one right here, he's not called. Is there more liberty to preach in this church than anywhere I've ever been? But still, even after doing it 21 years, I still get butterflies. Not a novice. In other words, a man has to prove himself. A man has to prove he knows this book. A man has to prove by having some life experience and going through some things. Not a novice. And, and I'll bring this out in a minute, but uh, can I say this? Whoever is a pastor has to be somebody that other people respect. You won't follow somebody you don't respect. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the combination of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Now, I'm not much, but you go out into the community here and start dropping my name and see if you don't find a good report. Go talk to the chief of police in Florence. Ask him about me. His name's Tom Graff. Go talk to Sheriff Helmick. Ask him. He don't know me well, but ask him about me. Go talk to principals of high schools. Go talk. Matter of fact, the only ones that I know of you're going to get a bad report on my name are other Baptist preachers. I've had some of them run me down. That's true. But you go out to talk to people in, in, the, in the community. I didn't live my life to go say, boy, I want them to have something good to say about me. I just live my life like I would for Christ. Amen. He goes on to say, lest they fall into a reproach and a snare of the devil. So there we find the qualifications of the pastor said there's two offices to the local church, the deacons. It says, likewise, must the deacons be grave, where grave means sober, of honest report. Not double-tongued. That means they don't go to one person and tell a story one way and then go to somebody else and tell it another way. That's hypocritical. They're not to be double-tongued. Not given to much wine. They can be given to some wine, not much wine. No, I'm just teasing. Yeah, Brandy's going, glory. Mm. Not greedy of filth or lu filthy lucre. I like this, this phrase, verse number 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. See, to the world, being saved by grace through faith is a mystery. They hold that mystery in good conscience. In other words, they live by faith. They live according to the Scriptures. They have a good conscience toward what God said. Verse number 10. And let these also first be proved. Very important. Uh, most churches used to, before they would uh, appoint a man to become a deacon, they'd set him aside for a year and watch his life. Let him prove himself. Is he faithful? Does he tithe? Does he, is, is he apt to teach? Does he know the Bible? Will he make a stand if something comes along? Or is he going to cower? Let him be proved. He goes on to say this. Uh, let, them use the, let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Or then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. We already discussed what blameless was. Even so, their wives uh, be grave, uh, not slander, sober, faithful in all things. Uh, see, I, I tell young preachers when I've taught them, your wife's 70% of your ministry. 
Your wife has to be faithful. Your wife has to have the right attitude. Your wife has to have the right disposition. Same with deacons. Huh? And then it goes on to say this. Uh, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. Let them rule their own children, their own houses well. For if they have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now let me just say a few things. We've talked about the requirements. Let me say something about deacons. It is not the deacon's job to rule the pastor. Now you go to any missionary Baptist church, that's the role of the deacon. He's more important than the pastor because he's to rule the pastor. Hmm? You find in Acts chapter 6 the appointment of deacons. The early church had grown. We know on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were added to the church. And then we find some more were added, about 5,000, a couple chapters over is added. The church has grown like wildfire in Jerusalem. And the apostles were being stretched so thin, taking care of the widows and the fathers, that they appointed deacons to serve their tables. Why? So the men of God could be given to prayer and study. And the most important thing the man of God can do is to be given to prayer and study. Now I know in 2020 that the little handbook that every Baptist has says that every pastor must show up to every birthday party, every hospital visit, when you get your sonograms, when little Johnny's got a runny nose, the pastor's got to be there. No, the pastor's job is to be given to prayer and study the Word of God. Now, if the pastor chooses to show up at the hospital, if the pastor chooses to show up at the birthday party, if the pastor chooses to show up and see your baby's first bowel movement or whatever, that's just an added blessing. It is the deacon's job to make sure the widows are taken care of, the widows indeed, true widows. The fatherless are taken care of. And that anything else on the pastor's table that would keep him from studying and seeking the will of God, uh, then that's their job to handle that. They're, they're to serve his table. Now, we've talked about the requirement of the officer. Let me give you the pastor's responsibilities. I mentioned that he's the overseer. Acts 20.28 20, says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. The pastor is to be the overseer. He's to watch for, out for the souls of those in his attendance. The pastor is to feed the flock of God. Now can I help you with something? How can one man teach or preach one message that affects everybody in the crowd? You've got some here that have been saved a long time. You've got some that's been preachers. You've got some that have just been saved a short time. How can you appeal to that one that's been saved a long time and that one who's been, been just saved a short time? How can you do it? You can't. But when you get a hold of God and God speaks to your heart and you do what God says and through you, God can speak to everybody. He's to be the overseer. I already mentioned this, but he's to be educated in the Scriptures. Most young preachers today, all they do is they study to get a thought, to get a message so they can get up and be the next Billy Graham. Very young preachers do personal studies. When I first fell in love with the Bible, I'd pick a topic and study it out to the nth degree. I wanted to know everything about it. I told you in starting this last week, this was not a college course that we'd be looking at. This is 47 years of study. The man of God needs to take this Bible and sometimes use it as a scalpel and other times use it as a sword. That doesn't happen without being skilled in studying the Bible. Now, I don't understand all of it. Half of it's not been told. But what I do know, you'll never convince me that I'm wrong on. Because I've studied it. God's proven it in my life. 
I've rightly divided it. And understand through the Holy Ghost what is true. The man of God not only needs to be educated in the Scriptures, he needs to be a leader. Can I say this? Everybody wants to lead, but not everybody can lead. You know, everybody wants to be Michael Jordan. Most people don't want to be John Stockton. Most people don't want to be the guy that passes Michael Jordan ball. Everybody wants to be Michael Jordan. The only problem was there was only one Michael Jordan. Hmm? Aiden, that was your time to say amen, bud. I, I mean, I'll give you a softball right there, bud. <laughs> the task of a leader is to take his followers to where they have not been. Moses led the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness because Moses would spend time with God and then do what God said. Not everybody can be a leader of men. Can I say this? The man of God needs to be an example. The man of God, the pastor, doesn't have any extra bone. He's not made of anything different than anybody else's. He's just committed himself more to the Lord than most people. But he's to be an example. There are some things the man of God doesn't do, not because it's not lawful. He doesn't do it because of what others may think. He's got to be an example. And the biggest qualification of a man of God, of a pastor, is he's got to be a servant. I don't know of a pastor who's ever been a true man of God who ever just long made up their mind, hey, I want to be a pastor. Most of us ran from it. Most of us wrestled with it. The first time I walked into Victory Baptist Church and preached down there, I knew God was calling me to, there to pastor. But I waited about 30 days, played the spiritual fasting and prayer card, because I didn't want it. I knew the history of the church. I didn't want it. I didn't want to leave where I was. I was comfortable where I was. I had a position where I was. I didn't want to go. I certainly didn't want to leave my job. Miss Nett was out to here pregnant with Christian. Aren't you glad he wasn't that big when you birthed him? Hmm? We'd have had a bus like that back there to tow you around in, huh? I didn't want a pastor. Six months before I got the call to go down there to Victory to preach for him. By the way, I still blame Brother Pittman. He's the one to call and turn my name in. I was sitting in a revival meeting. Belvin Sisson was preaching. And God started eating my lunch. I went to... Uh, Study my devotions the next morning before I went to work and I read the first ten chapters in the book of Proverbs and I've done told you Proverbs is not a book you just read casually. I mean, you've got to discern in between each verse. It, it can stop the thought once or twice in a verse. I read the first ten chapters, closed my Bible, and the Lord said, keep reading. I got over to the thirteenth chapter of Proverbs and in, a, in that middle of that chapter... There was a verse that wouldn't mean anything to any one of you. But in that verse, God said, you're going to pastor. Because I'd ask God, I said, God, I'll do whatever you want out of my life. Whatever, I, I, whatever you want, I'll do it. Just let me know. And in that verse, he let me know I'd pastor. Six months later, I was pastoring the Victory Baptist Church. Didn't want to. Huh? Somebody who's eagerly wanting to pastor, they don't understand the call of the pastor. Pastors to be a servant. Why do you think I go last whenever we have a dinner? Because I'm to serve you, not lord over you. Why do you think for years 
when the deacons, and if you don't know who our deacons are, Brother Bob and Brother, Brother Randy, when they would come to me and want to do something for me, I'd tell them no. Because I didn't feel worthy. That sorry no good learned the secret. Preacher, every time we do something for you, God's good to the church, and you want God to bless the church, don't you? So let us do And I can't tell him no. So I, this is what I do. I said, well, you go sell it to Miss Annette. If she'll do it, we're, we're on board. Because he's afraid of her. He won't even go talk to her. The pastor is to be a servant. Now, let me say this lastly. I'll wind this down tonight. It's been longer than I thought it would be. The pastor is to be respected. His office is a respectable office, but if the man who's in the office isn't respectable, he don't need to be in the office. But the pastor is to be respected. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 13, 7, Remember them which have the rule over you. Now remember I told you the pastor is an overseer. He's not the Lord over God's sheep. But God says he has the rule over you. He goes on to say, Who has spoken unto you the word of God? Whose faith follow? He's to be the example. Considering the end of their conversation. Verse 17 of chapter 13 of Hebrews says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. You're to respect him because he watches for your soul. You're to respect him because he preaches and teaches to you the word of God. You're to respect him because when you do, he can do his job with joy and not grief because when he has to do it through grief it's unprofitable for you can I say this 1 Timothy 5.17 says let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine the Bible says the man of God is worthy of double honor That means if you respect the president, you ought to respect your pastor twice as much. That means if you respect your boss, you ought to respect the pastor twice as much. That, rem that means no matter what you think he is worthy of, he's really worthy of double that. He's worthy of double honor. That's what the Bible said. That's not what I said. That's what the Bible says. Hmm? Can I say this? He's to be respected. He has responsibilities and he has requirements. Also the deacons. I'm thankful, thankful we have godly deacons. They don't try to tell the pastor what to do. But they're quick to do anything the pastor asks. And they're men of good report. And they're men who are servants. I've told you when we installed them as deacons. They met the measuring stick of the first qualification. They're servants. If they're not willing to serve God's people. They don't need to be in the position. You know, let me just say this. Deacons and pastors are just part of the gifts that God gave to the local church. In Ephesians 4.11, the Bible says, And he gave some apostles, and there are no more apostles. To be an apostle, you had to see Jesus Christ in the flesh. Now, I know you can go to some of these feel-good church of gods, and they'll say, Apostle Ron Carpenter, now they're a liar, okay? There is no such thing as apostle. John was the last one, huh? And some prophets, there's nobody that prophesies anymore. You know, before there was the completed word of God, when that which is perfect shall come, that which is in part shall be done away with, and God would send prophets to prophesy the will of God. And you knew he was God's man because everything they prophesied came to pass. But there aren't any more apostles. There aren't any more prophets. Okay? Because we have the completed word of God. And he said, and some evangelists. Now let me qualify that. In the day society, you got these guys who are evangelists. They run all over the country preaching in churches every week and preach the same five messages every week. That's not the definition of a Bible evangelist. A Bible evangelist is what we would call a missionary. He's a church planner. 
Somebody wins souls, plants a church, then moves on, plants another church, moves on. That's a true definition of a biblical evangelist. Hmm? A lot of these guys won't even go out knocking on doors with you. Hmm? And then he says the other gifts of the church are some pastors and some teachers. Those are gifts to the church. That's God's gift to every church. A church that's struggling without a pastor, they need God's blessing. Give them a man of God. Let me close this thing with this thought. There are other positions in the church. There's only two offices, but there are other positions in the church. They're all needy. Hmm? Now listen, in the church of the wilderness, you had Moses. Then you had Aaron and Hur. Aaron and Hur would be what we would call the deacons. They held up his hands when the battle was on, and while his hands were up, they, Israel prevailed. When his hands fell, then Israel lost the battle. But then you had Joshua, and you had others who served in, in the tabernacle, and in, in, in those sort of things. And, and we have other positions in the church. They're all important. They're vital. Uh, Brother Thad's our treasurer. That's the worst job to church, right there. He resigns every Sunday, and I won't let him. He's been the treasurer 21 years. I won't let him quit. Huh? He's, he wants to resign because he shares an office with his wife and with Jordan. I mean, he quits every Sunday. I said, no. He's got the worst job making sure all the money's accounted for. That's a terrible job. Hmm? Brother Thad's our treasurer. Miss Tammy's our church secretary. She got a terrible job too. We're indebted. You realize that couple right there probably spends 10, 12 hours a week just making sure all the bills are paid, all the money's taken care of, everything's what it's supposed to be. Uh, you better pray they live till the rapture. Uh, and then Jordan's our mission treasure. Our mission treasure. Miss Kathy's our church clerk. She keeps the record straight, and anytime we vote on something, or anytime we take on a missionary, anytime we add a church member or something, she keeps all that straight. I have a record of all that. Why? God kept a record of all them people that was part of Israel. It's very important. She keeps all that. Huh? We have a lot of Sunday school teachers do a great job. Miss Pam's been teaching 21 years here. Hmm? Does a great job. She teaches the little ones because she's got a kind of mind of a little one. She does great. Miss Kathy's been teaching 20 years here. My wife's a teacher. Miss Jackie started teaching the little, little ones. Uh, Miss Renee's a teacher. You know, we got teachers. They're very important. Do a great job. And then we have those working the children's ministry. Brother Peter runs that. And, and we got a lot of folks that dedicate their Sunday night service to teaching our kids. And, and you know, very involved. You know, Miss Dawn, the Ellis's, uh, Miss Noreen, uh, um, Miss Brandy, and I might probably leaving somebody out, but they spend every Sunday night, uh, Brother Tommy, you know, he don't really matter. He just does voices for puppets. But they, they, they teach him kids over there. Very, very important. Uh, Miss Marcy, she's the church photographer, and she, she keeps a lot of stuff like that and keeps things going and keeps, keeps the library and all that. And very, very important stuff. Brother Josh is our associate pastor. He orders all the Sunday school stuff and keeps the Sunday school running. He's a Sunday school superintendent under that. And he makes certain we got all the tracks and keeps all that bagged up for when we go out on visitation and all that. And takes all that off of me. Oh, we got so many people doing so many things. And that's why our church is so great. Because people are busy working, doing things. I left out Brother Clint teaches the teens. You know, Jordan and Josh and Brittany teach the teens on Sunday nights. Miss Sonny does all the needlework and all the alterations of the whole church. I mean, we got folks doing stuff all around here. Miss Tina's involved in ladies' meeting. Miss Dawn's involved in ladies' meeting. We got so many folks involved. And so many people want to give all the credit to the pastor. And see, a, a real leader knows how to delegate and give people things to do and then let them do it. We have some folks that do a lot of great work. We've got the guys that work up in the sound room, guys that video. Brother Aaron makes certain all of our social media is all. I mean, there's a whole lot goes into us having church. And I'm so thankful 
that God fitly framed us together, knew who we'd need, when we'd need them, how we'd need them, and uh, God's good. But the officers, they're ordained to their positions. They certainly stand out and take the brunt and make some decisions that a lot of other people just wouldn't make. That's why God's got them in those positions. I left out we have trustees that make sure they secure all the finances when we need them and all that. Brother Rod and him, Miss Lynn are traveling tonight. Brother Rod's one of our trustees. Brother Randy and Brother Ray are trustees. So many folks involved making our church what it is. And I'm thrilled as I started out to be the pastor of this local church to see all that God's done. And I'm excited because I've already got a little insight on what he's going to do. And just hang around, neighbor. No telling all that God's going to do. All right, we'll stop there tonight. <clears throat> I know it was just kind of giving information. But maybe you're here tonight and you just want to pray. I'd hate to not have an invitation. Somebody here tonight might just need to come and ask the Lord for something specific in their life. Somebody might need to just come and thank God for our good church. Somebody, God might have spoke to you something about something specifically and you just want to come and, and talk to Him about it. Maybe tonight you're here and God revealed something that's lacking in your life and you just want to do business with God. But we want to give you that opportunity. So let's all stand. Miss Renee, just come play something on the piano. And while she's playing, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. We're so appreciative of your church. Lord, we know you're the head of the church, and you fitly framed us together. God, you've given us a work to do in this community. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless these thy people. Pray you'd meet every need of every heart. God, I pray that, Lord, you'd help us to take these truths and, Lord, to go out into a lost and dying world and let them know Jesus loves them and Jesus will save them. God, there may be somebody here tonight, maybe some young person or somebody here tonight that realizes they're not saved and they need to get saved. I pray during this invitation they'd come, give their heart and life to Jesus. Lord, somebody just might have a specific need in their life, and God, you revealed it to them. I pray they'd come, just do business with God. Have your will and way in this invitation now. Speak to hearts and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on daily devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.